with me right now is Paul Schrader, the <coughs> filmmaker who has authored a lot of films that we all know, Taxi Driver, Raging Bull. Uh, he wrote and directed, uh, correct me if I go wrong mm -hmm. here, Blue Collar, um, American Gigolo, Cat People. Have I made any mistakes so no, far? No, no. And his latest film is the, the highly controversial, uh, it seems all over the world, mm -hmm. film Mishima, sometimes pronounced Mishima in America, mm -hmm. mistakenly. Uh, about Yukio Mishima, the Japanese writer, who was, uh, I guess, the most famous writer Japan has produced in modern times. And you've seen films of some of his novels and adaptations, Sailor Who Fell from Grace from the Sea, from Grace with the Sea, for example. Uh, his books are in print and still sell a lot here. Um, and he died, as uh, you may recall, in 1970 at the age of 54, I believe. 45. I mean, I'm 45. There was reverse numbers when it's the other side of the world. Uh, <laughs> by a, a spectacular harakiri or seppuku in public, um, in which he disemboweled himself and was <coughs> beheaded in a ritual manner. Uh, Paul Schrader attacked this subject that, for reasons we may get into, nobody did in Japan, or this country for that matter. A story with <coughs> plenty of built in drama. Um, I wonder if I've stopped introducing you when okay. we're talking now. I'm supposed are. to say, will you welcome Paul Schrader, but it always seems so sad. <laughs> yeah. 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 Apparently they will. <laughs> I, I guess, why Schrader? I don't know. I didn't invite me. <laughs> oh, I don't mean here. <laughs> oh. Oh. Well, the, the, I know what you mean by that. <laughs> uh, you, 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 Anybody who does publicity for your because film, they come down to you because uh, it's yeah. easier than getting someone from the Kabuki company who plays a part in it. Yes, uh, unfortunately, I'm the only one uh, representing yeah. the film who speaks English, so I end up having to do the lion's share of all of this. It isn't enough to have made the film. Now you have to go out and talk about Sell it. it. Uh, but why you only, why you were the one who got that subject, when I would have thought in my naive way that plenty of people would have thought, here's a movie just aching to be made. Yeah. Uh, uh, there's a certain amount of persistence involved, and also uh, uh, I've been involved, uh, my brother and I involved in uh, Japan in and out now for about 15 years. Mm -hmm. And it was four years of negotiating with the estate uh, to secure the rights to the novels. Yeah. Uh, you know, basically we could have made an agreement the first day, but then it takes another four years to prove your intentions. Uh, and uh, I mean, I think I was the only one who had the patience and the uh, foolhardiness to actually stick it out. Mm -hmm. Did you read any of those many books with variations on the title, How to Do Business with the Japanese? Um, no, no. I, I actually, I had, uh, uh, had a little connection with Japan and Japanese before it became a, a publishing industry. Mm -hmm. And so I had kind of figured these things out to, before the, the how to books came out. Yeah. I suppose the general reaction here was when he committed suicide in that dramatic, mm -hmm. movie-like way, was the guy had to be crazy. Can the American um, consciousness or whatever ever understand this? Can you understand it? Uh, well, there's, that's sort of a misnomer right there, uh, in that uh, we have a tendency to say we can't understand Mishima because we're Americans. Mm -hmm. Believe me, the Japanese do not understand him either. He is as unfathomable to them. Yeah. Uh, perhaps more so because they feel they should understand him. And we just assume we can't. Mm -hmm. And maybe, therefore, we can understand him better. Um, and he, uh, he is the most, obviously, most peculiar man, and a puzzle of a man, who uh, was a prodigy as a writer and uh, wrote very quickly and became famous very young. Yeah. And then grew disenchanted with the words themselves and gradually turned himself into one of his own characters, one of his own creations. And so that his final work uh, uh, is his death. Uh, and it was staged uh, as one would stage a, a theater production. The location was selected, the audience was notified, the, the press was notified, uh, the date was known a year in advance, the, he designed the costumes, and he wrote the script. And, uh, and he cloaked it in a kind of political uh, facade in order to give it a, a greater importance. But basically what it was was the final uh, interior drama that he had been acting out and reacting for uh, 20 years. He has to be one of the strangest men who ever lived because you'd think that, uh, first of all, it would be enough for most people to have a, a, a wife and a family and a very successful writing career and all of that. And without having to also 
rebuild your body, have a private army, <laughs> um, to become a target almost. Uh, he, he would willingly go to places where he knew he would be booed and hissed, hissed and so forth. Uh, his very controversial uh, Confessions of a Mask, yeah, yeah. his first book, which was a biography of a young man's yeah. developing homosexuality, among other things. Uh, so he had just almost everything you could imagine was part of his life, and the yeah, mixture I, was. I, well, I, I think that the, you know, the secret of his life was that he was really a, a functioning schizophrenic, and that uh, uh, that he could move very easily between all these masks and guises. In fact, he felt very comfortable behind each mask. And if you were a literary friend and you were going to have dinner with him, the agenda of your conversation would be known, and you would discuss this, mm -hmm. and you would be, you would not be allowed to discuss another subject your homosexual friend, that you would behave in a certain way. Yeah. And none of these uh, masks ever, ever met. And, and I think may, probably because in the center there was just a big hole. Mm -hmm. And all there was was all these sides. And, uh, and, and then he grew to this notion that true harmony in life, uh, all these contradictions can only be harmonized in, a, in, in death. And uh, as one of his biographers wrote about him, he had a, you know, a lifelong sexual desire for death. Um, that's strange, <laughs> and uh, <Yeah. clears throat> and I guess that's crazy. But they sex and death have always been tied <laughs> yes. together. I mean, the the, yes. the orgasm being a small a little death in Shakespeare, all yeah, the puns about death and, and to die. John, John Donne and all those people. Yeah, yeah. The first John Donne, and uh, <laughs> the but I, I think that uh, if I can re regain my train of thought. Uh, which was. You hate doing this kind of thing. <laughs> I feel sorry for uh, But you do it very, very well. Uh, we're talking about the fact that he had all these contradictions in him, that he was a functioning schizophrenic, you yeah. said, and that, and that he uh, programmed this death and talked about sex and, and uh, death as being together. Yeah, I mean, I mean, this notion that. Intertwined uh, that and the, romantic the, ideas. The real harmony of, you know, uh, all these contradictions. Uh, can be harmonized then at the moment of death. Yeah. And, and in fact, the very form of death, which uh, of Stabaku, is in a way so delightfully metaphorically male and female. Because, you know, it's mm -hmm. both, you know you're, you're playing both, both halves of the relationship. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and in the Orient, the stomach being the, the soul. And yeah. uh, uh, he, he, he really got his, you know, his motor cooking on all these kinds of elaborate metaphors mm -hmm. and uh, drove himself into... Uh, uh, you know, going down a progressively narrow corridor till finally the only light at the end of the corridor was this uh, oft-rehearsed death. As a child, he he always was obsessed with pictures of knights dying in bloody armor and uh, yeah. the, uh, the saint with the arrows yeah, yeah, in him that he posed. He posed as interestingly and, uh, Western projections. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There are, the character you created in Taxi Driver, played by De Niro, certainly had a dark side, mm -hmm. presumably influenced a presidential assassin. Uh -huh. uh, is there a... Uh, hmm, what am I trying to say? Well, let me is there a let strange... Me, let, let me let you off. Does this mean anything to you at all? Well, uh, first of all, I, I, I'm one of, those, one of these people that, that believes art actually works. Art works? It works. That mm. uh, you can purge certain antisocial uh, feelings uh -huh. through uh, either watching or creating a surrogate. And uh, so that by writing about a taxi driver or seeing one, you don't have to be one. Uh, I, I actually believe, you know, art has a social function in that way. Uh, for Mishima, it didn't. Every time he created a successful fantasy, uh, a book, a play, and it was vastly popular, all it did was drove his fantasy needs up to a, yet a higher level. And, and they became more and more hyperbolic, and eventually they took over his private life. Uh, mm -hmm. this, is, this is fascinating because uh, here was an extremely good writer and a very famous and, and very celebrated, but for whom art really wasn't working. It was only making his problems greater. Uh, I, I don't know the answer to that, but that was certainly one of the things that attracted me to this film. This is almost <clears throat> a strained parallel, but one of the classic defenses of pornography is that it leads to masturbation <clears throat> on the part of the people who buy yeah. it. And therefore, it presents, prevents them from committing mm -hmm. sex crimes for, at times, and they've proved mm -hmm. this and so forth. So this would be a, a, an example of the case where this exception, where it didn't work, it only made it worse. And yeah, I, I, I hate, I'd hate to do that. It's not a good parallel, but yeah, it's... Yeah, I hate to do that parallel because pornography we, has now veered off into an area that, that is un, uh, unforgivable. I mean... What's that? 
I mean, just the, the degree to which pornography has gone, which is a whole oh, other discussion, yeah. is, is masturbation is no longer enough. Yeah. Uh, but an interesting point is in Japan, Japanese pornography, and that especially favored by Japanese yeah. high school girls, yes. is a very beautiful young male character who dies a bloody death while still yes. in the prime of his yeah. life. They are very, very much enamored of, yeah. uh, of violence. And I'm not selling this book, nor is it Mr. Schrader's. It's one of a... Uh, it's a biography of Mishima, significantly written by a John Nathan, clearly not a Japanese name. The point being, it was one that, of Mishima's uh, translators. Yeah. Now, um, Norman Mailer talked about meeting this skinny little Japanese man once, and being told later that that was Mishima who had committed suicide years later. He yeah. said, "But I saw pictures of him. He was a burly." Right. Uh, here's a picture of him after he body built himself, and it shows him not only with his samurai sword, probably the one that he killed himself yes. with, which mm -hmm. is a 16th century museum yeah. piece. Or so he said. Uh, or he said. <laughs> but uh, uh, that, that, that he had, it shows all of his obsessions, yeah. I suppose, yeah. the narcissism, the yeah. implicit homosexuality. Of the it, it, interestingly, in all those photos, you never see the bi his lower legs because those muscles were not needed, uh, needed to commit se uh, seppuku. He only worked on the muscles that he needed. And interestingly enough, he committed seppuku or harakiri in some one or possibly two films as an actor, didn't he? At yes. least one I know of. Yeah, well, one was a, uh, he, he directed his own uh, version of a short story he wrote in which he pre-enacted his death. Mm -hmm. He also pre-enacted his death for a um, series of still photographs, which are still, um, uh, have, yet, have, not, have never been released. By whose orders? Uh, well, they hadn't come out yet when he died. Hmm. So they're still, in the, from coming out? They're, they're still in the photographer's vaults. Uh -huh. Maybe when the photographer dies, or maybe when this whole generation dies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, here, here he is as St. Sebastian, which also shows... He, he was traumatized as a young man by the famous painting of St. Sebastian with the arrows in him and later posed as uh, yeah, St. Well, Sebastian. Uh, I mean, just the, uh, the, the degree of that. the concentration... Is, uh, this particular uh, painting by Guido Rene, uh he writes in his uh, autobiographical book was the object of his first, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I was going to say ejaculation or masturbation. And mm -hmm. then, uh, and that was at the age of 16, and then 30 years later, just before his death, he poses as the object of his own sexual desire. Yeah. It takes a lot to hold that for 30 years. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a fascinating thing in many ways. For one thing, everybody thinks that Mishima is his or her own property. Uh, a lot of people don't want to talk about him mm -hmm. in Japan, partly because of the political implications of his right-wing exhortations mm -hmm. to take the public back to a militarist kind of thing that they see as mm -hmm. dangerous. Um, also because, uh, I'm sure my Japanese friends will forgive me, they don't think foreigners have any business talking about him. Yeah, well, I mean, one of the tenets of Japanese personality is that uh, a Westerner can never ever truly understand the Japanese. Mm. Uh, that is a, a given, you know. And if you want to make a Japanese very anxious, you just say, you know, you Japanese are, are, are like people all around the world. Uh, that, that will upset them. If you want to make a Japanese quite happy, you have to say, there's no one in the world like you. Because mm -hmm. that's sort of the, the whole idea of the island culture and being cut off. So, well, for 200 years, it was illegal <laughs> to leave the country. Yes. So, for some it, reason. It's only in the last 100 years that they even thought that people could speak their language, mm -hmm. uh, uh, non-Japanese could speak their language. So, uh, so here you have a figure that is very, very upsetting to the Japanese because they don't know how, what to deal with them, how, how to deal with them, because he put himself above uh, society. That was his big sin. It wasn't politics, it wasn't homosexuality. It was, uh, they have a saying in Japan, the nail that sticks up will be hammered down. And he made sure he would never be hammered down in his lifetime, and then, mm -hmm. and then by his death, he would never be hammered down throughout history. So he it deeply offends him at that level. So he falls in, into, into limbo. He simply is not discussed. And then the idea that uh, a foreigner would uh, presume to discuss a character that they are not willing to discuss, mm -hmm. uh, it creates even more anxiety. Well, we only have a few minutes left, and this is an endlessly interesting <laughs> subject, as you know, and every, yeah. everybody who's seen the film has his or her... I've never heard it, such a variety of prejudices that people brought to a movie yes. and from it and so on. So I commend you on your courage and taking this on in what would seem like a no-win situation in every direction. Were you harassed by um, 
the family when you made the film? Uh, not, no, I had a legal agreement with the family, and then the widow changed her mind and broke off relations. But we were harassed by some members of the far right, but I not personally, because mm. I, as a foreigner, have the status of a drunk or a baby. You know, I'm not really responsible for what I do. <laughs> but see. the Japanese staff were, were threatened, yes. Because of admirers of his wanting to think this was movie we was not well, uh, going to be flattering? For, for participating in, 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 in this dirty laundry process of uh, bringing I this see. to the public and, and also possibly besmirching the name of, uh, of their hero. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, I noticed that in the paperback editions of a biography of his, in the English one they show the severed head lying yeah. on the floor and in the American edition <laughs> they don't. Every, every other yeah. word in every other picture is identical. But then the English have always been yes. bloodier than we have. Another island culture. Yeah. The Tower of London isn't there by accident, I guess. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry, I've offended another empire. <laughs> Could we take a quick look at uh, Mishima himself? This is a Fuji Terebi, or Fuji Television, as you mm -hmm. Americans say. Uh, lend us this. This is the real man. This is yeah. not from Paul's film. Yeah. And um, well, within okay. minutes before his own death, in which he harangued the troops below, but the, soldiers. But they couldn't, they couldn't hear him, and then he went back inside and, and committed the suicide with also one of his uh, cadets. Mm -hmm. And they yelled insults at him. And did, did Yeah, basically they couldn't hear him. Did you choose to have him seem surprised at that in the film? Was he surprised at that? Well, when he, he came back in, he said they laughed at me, didn't he? Yeah, well, that's what he, he said, although he came there fully prepared to die. I think he would have been more surprised if they had listened to him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> The martyrdom was important, or the, Absolutely. the injustice of it all. Is there any chance, didn't he release some document to the press saying, if this thing that's going to happen yeah. doesn't happen, do you think that anywhere in his mind he thought maybe he wouldn't do it? Well, he was terrified of getting caught in the process, you know, because, Prevented. The, because the fantasy would then would live forever as, as, as a disgrace. Mm -hmm. Aren't there older generation Japanese, though, who hail what he did and might still, even though it was the first public uh, seppuku since World War II, in the sense that <clears throat> we fail to understand yeah. that this is an honorable death? Yeah, well, they, they hail it, but with such qualifications, because normally seppuku is supposed to be self-effacing, I will die for my country. In mm -hmm. his case, it was uh, self-advertisement, I will die for myself. Mm -hmm. So uh, even those who admire it I can only admire it from a distance. Did you have any decisions whether to play him as a certifiable madman then, or as a man? No, he never was. Uh, he was. He was absolutely. He was like I say, a functioning schizophrenic. So that, mm -hmm. you know, he just went about his daily business in a completely lucid way, and everyone was taken by surprise when he died. Yeah. Does his wife um, has she seen the film? You know, she may widow? have. Uh, she has not said if she has, and I, I doubt whether she ever will. You know. It's just not befitting. What was her big concern and fear? Uh, that, I mean, she wishes Mishima to be remembered as a great writer rather than a great scandal. And therefore, everything that borders on the scandalous, which is a whole lot, was problematic to her. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, my job was to, I, I wanted to make the film about the writer anyway, because what, if I wanted to do a movie about homosexual or a right winger, mm -hmm. uh, there's plenty of those, but there's only one Mishima. So I did, uh, I did it about the writing, you know, and art and, uh, when art turns to life. By the way, did you ever, did you get a slight chill when you read that Hinckley, who tried to kill the president, took some of his inspiration from the, that obsession with the movie Taxi Driver and Jodie Foster? Well, and yes and no. I, I heard the news come over the radio and I said to the, uh, we were scouting locations, I said to the, the driver, oh, it's one of those taxi driver kids. This was before his name had even come out. Mm -hmm. And uh, because those kids are a genre, and the genre existed long before I wrote the script. And uh, well, when you heard it in the news, you said to a, a limousine driver, "This is one of those taxi driver I types." Said to a van driver, <laughs> a van driver, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> <laughs> that no, this is one of those taxi driver kids, and it turned out it was. It turned out it was. But, it, but it, I mean, I... I'm not about to ask you if you're responsible for the attack on the president, because I don't see how you could be, but... No, uh, I mean, it, it's, a whole, it's a whole genre of, of a certain kind of white bread youth yeah. uh, that the film depicts, but uh, I don't think the film accelerates it in any way. And, and in fact, it, honestly, it probably decelerates it. But it's, mm -hmm. all those loose cannons are out there just... They, they, the deck. A lot more of them will hook onto Rambo and Eastwood than they will hook onto a, a complex portrait like mm -hmm. De Niro's. Mm -hmm. There are probably people who would kill from seeing Little Women for some reason. <laughs> the movie by the same name, I mean. <laughs> well, on that 
upbeat <laughs> note, we would have to say goodbye to you. I see why people say you're so interesting. Nice to meet you, Paul Schrader. Thank Pleasure. you. Pleasure. We'll see you next time, and goodbye. <laughs>